Hey, it's Doug. Welcome to this Throwback Thursday episode. First Thursday of every month, we're going to profile one of our older episodes. This time, going back to episode 20 of Stories and Strategies, so kind of way back in the beginning. We first published this episode in September of 2020, and I'll be honest, I have not stopped thinking about this episode ever since. Absolutely one of my favorites. A thought-provoking discussion with Anne Gregory from Huddersfield University and Jean Velin, the former chair of the Canadian Public Relations Society, or CPRS. Together, they dig into the ethical impacts of artificial intelligence on public relations. And remember, this is before ChatGPT, which came out later. The world is increasingly driven by AI, and since ChatGPT, I mean, kaboom! Um, So many different dimensions, political, social, economic, uh, even our everyday choices. Uh, And Gregory emphasizes that understanding AI is crucial for PR professionals because AI influences all these spheres where PR operates. Jean Valen adds that PR practitioners must comprehend the construction and pitfalls of artificial intelligence to provide informed advice to their organizations. There's two critical points I want you to listen for in this in this episode. Number one is power and manipulation. Anne Gregory discusses how AI can lead to the emergence of a new elite with organizations capable of predicting and guiding our behaviors using rich data. The potential for manipulation necessitates vigilance from PR pros to ensure ethical practices. And secondly, the nature of work. Jean Velin highlights how AI is transforming work, especially repetitive tasks at the lower end of the skills spectrum, which increasingly are automated. PR professionals need to focus on honing management, communication, and analytical skills to stay relevant in an AI-permeated environment. I hope you enjoy this episode. It is one of our older ones, so some of the sound quality isn't quite the same. We've gotten better as we've moved down the road, but enjoy this episode. It has left me thinking, well, literally for years. We'll see you next week with a fresh episode. Twenty-three centuries ago, Aristotle determined that persuasion comprises a combination of three appeals. Ethos, meaning ethics. Pathos, meaning empathy or emotion. And logos, meaning logic. He determined that ethos comes first, establish trust, and then use emotion followed by logic to reinforce it. Today on Stories and Strategies, Communications Ethics, particularly in a world of increasing artificial intelligence. To quote Dr. Martin Luther King, the time is always right to do what's right. My name is Doug Downs. I have two guests today, the authors of The Ethics Guide to Artificial Intelligence in PR, co-produced by the Chartered Institute of Public Relations and the Canadian Public Relations Society. Here come the acronyms, CIPR and CPRS. Professor Anne Gregory joining us today from Huddersfield in Yorkshire. Hello, Anne. Hello, Doug. Good to be with you. Good to be with you. And Jean Valin joining us today from Chelsea, Quebec, which Jean, I think, is just northwest of Gatineau. Uh, Salut, Jean. Salut, Doug. Anne, you are a professor of corporate communication at the University of Huddersfield. You have your PhD in contemporary issues in public relations from Leeds Beckett University, a bachelor's degree in English and philosophy from the University of Leeds. You are a fellow at the Royal Society of Arts, a past president of the Chartered Institute of Public Relations and an honorary fellow with CIPR and a past chair of the Global Alliance for Public Relations and Communications Management. And Jean, you are a principal at Valin Strategic Communications in Chelsea. You were awarded your accreditation, your APR to use an acronym, in 1987, and called to the College of Fellows, your FCPRS in 2001. 
You are a past president of CPRS, the 2014 recipient of the CPRS Highest Individual Award, the Philip Nobokov Award for Lifetime Achievements, an honorary fellow with the Chartered Institute of Public Relations and a founding member of the Global Alliance for Public Relations and Communications Management. May I say how wonderful to be able to speak with you both today. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Doug. We sound yeah. impressive, don't we? But you we're do. actually just ordinary people. See, now <laughs> both of you can't wait to hear what you're going to say. <laughs> CIPR and CPRS recently co-published the Ethics Guide to Artificial Intelligence in PR. It's a result of the AI in PR panel, which was developed by the Chartered Institute. And we've provided a link to download the report in the show notes to this episode. There's no getting away from it. We live in a world of algorithms and coded decision making and all of that I would suggest is AI. It's not PR. So why should PR people bother to understand all this? It's precisely because the world in all its dimensions is being driven by AI. Political world, social world, economic world, our shopping and buying habits, everything. And um, this is uh, where PR works. So, you know, in the social world, uh, we, we all make entertainment choices. We get information on hobbies. We choose even pet toys um, it, via AI these days. And uh, those of us who work in consumer PR will be working for those sorts of organizations. In the political world, we know that big data is driving campaigns. So we operate as public relations professionals in all these fields. Is. So we need to know what's going on. We give advice to organizations who live with this, with these tools. And so we, it's, it just is important for us to understand this world, how it's built, the pitfalls of AI, because there are many. And if we don't understand the world we live in, which includes AI, then we're not doing our job giving advice to our organizations or leaders. Because you're right. I mean, in public relations, we don't use a lot of AI tools. We use a lot of automation tools. This is what some of our previous uh, research has found out. But still, we live in this environment where AI permeates. So we must understand it. Now, you've identified six macro issues in public relations and the use of artificial intelligence. Could you outline those six? Yeah, we'll take them in turn. So I'll uh, kick off with uh, social change, dog. So... <laughs> AI is changing the way that we live in and work in very profound ways. And those who take advantage of AI, who have the knowledge, the resources um, to capture leadership in the field will become the new elite in our view. And this is not just the big tech companies like Google and Amazon, but NGOs. We've seen the World Health Organization working uh, about the pandemic and gathering information, tracking disease, for example, across the world, all that is AI empowered. Governments too, increasingly you'll hear the words digital by default for government. That is partly because it's efficient, but it's also about collecting data about us. Society is changing. There's a new elite emerging and those elite people have huge amounts of power. Let me kick off with the change in the nature of work, which is the other macro issue we've identified. I talked about that just a few minutes ago when I mentioned media clippings and, and that sort of automation process that's taking over there. Generally, what we see is that if something is repetitive, if it's predictable in the way things will, will happen, if the decision-making process, it will be automated. So the more repetitive a task is, and typically those are at the lower end of the skills uh, side of, in, in professions. These will be assisted by AI in some way. So, I mean, if you look at the nature of work, that's gonna transform. All of those entry level jobs will, be, will become even more, requiring even more of you in terms of a skill set. So for us in public relations, that means a focus on your ability to write, your ability to edit, and definitely working on your management skills, your literary, literary skills, and all of the human empathy and analysis skills that we bring to the table, that's going to change the nature of work for many professions, including those in public relations. If you look at any, any uh, sort of profession that has a, a, a decision-making process that starts with data, analysis, and options for decision-making, that can all be automated using algorithms. So if you think of that as a conceptual framework, a lot of the nature of work that is at the lower end of the skills Will fall, will fall off to machines or assisted by tools. 
and everything at the higher end of the scales will require more of you if you're if you're currently studying pay attention to all those of the management aspects of the job pay attention to the human elements and the, the technical qualities of the of the work that requires video skills writing skills the ability to communicate the ability to listen and the ability to give proper advice and i mentioned power earlier doug and to mention that to those who capital, uh, capitalize on AI will increase their power. And I'm not sure that people have really got a grasp of this, but the rich data on people and groups um, means that organizations, whether they be governments or, or commercial companies, can predict our behavior. Now, predictive analytics is now entering into the lexicon, common language. They know what we like. And not only that, they can guide our behavior. So uh, they can serve as smarter and faster, can these organizations, but that potential for manipulation, I think we really need to guard against. And people don't even know that they're being manipulated, manipulated partly because they don't know what the other choices are, but also algorithms are great are picking out our preferences and serving those things that we like. And we like liking those things that they say that we like. So we don't even know that we're being manipulated. Um, and people might have made different choices if they had a, bro a broader range, we just don't know. And in public relations, you know, we profile people to improve our communications. We optimize our channel mix. We, we construct messages that are appealing to them and we use big data to make those sorts of choices. So we need to be really careful of the ethical implications of this. And Anne's mentioned algorithms a few times and that's our next big issue. If you think of on a scale of, of sophistication, algorithms basically at the lower end of the scale functions on the concept of if this, then that. The good example of that is the notification you get when your calendar says a reminder here pops into your screen. That's based on if this, then that technology. And that's a simple algorithm. At the other end of the scale, you've got very sophisticated algorithms, the ones Anne's mentioned that guess what you like, keep feeding you what you like, collect data. Basically, there are no algorithms possible if there are no data. And you're giving that data away every time you click on something, every time you read something, there are algorithms fishing all the data and processing that, analyzing it, refining the script of the algorithm so that they keep feeding you more and more of what they think you want to see. The problem with algorithms is they don't do nuance very well. They're based on the if this then that type of technology. And if that's the case, then you're gonna find that there are big holes in the way algorithms are constructed. And that's why we're advocating for PR people to get in there with AI build teams so that you understand what they're doing with the algorithms, what fed the algorithm, what kinds of data issues are in the algorithm because that's the fuel that the machine runs on. So we know that algorithms don't do nuance very well. They also discriminate almost by design. They must exclude things. They're binary choices that need to happen at various points in the way the software is, is built. So that's the kinds of problems we see with algorithms and they're everywhere. So we have to get in there as PR people and have a robust understanding of how they're built and challenge the way they're built so that they're more inclusive, they're more diverse, and they do the job better at what they're supposed to do. And then there are issues around privacy and transparency. So what data is collected about us? How is it stored? Um, when AI is commissioned, how are those algorithms trained? For example, do they use personal data? How do we know that they use personal data? A lot of public concern about how data is collected and stored and shared, as you know, Doug. That's why the GDB, GDPR, General Data Protection Regulations, are now current in, in Europe. And California has also brought in rules similar to GDPR just this year. Issues of transparency is, uh, around how our data is used, uh, for how long, um, can it be changed? Can it be aggregated with other people's data? What's it, uh, who's, what's it collected for? By whom? Um, so these things are really important because we don't know at the moment. So our data, our personal data can be collected and it may be used in a political campaign. 
We don't even know that. So what is known about us and uh, transparency in algorithms is really, really important. These are huge ethical issues for us. We talked about bias, which is our, our sixth and final macro issue we've identified in the guide. Uh, bias is such an important element to understand because humans are biased. We make decisions based on our perception of the world, our view of the world. We know that's imperfect. That's why we need to bounce off ideas of colleagues and, and contrary-minded people so that we arrive at a, at a robust decision that is well thought through and not biased. And, and so if you think of AI, it's going to have built-in bias to begin with. But the problem is they can be amplified by machines. Generally speaking, we need to understand it. We need to understand where the bias challenges are in the AI tools, and we need to be able to challenge those decisions in the boardroom. Okay, those six macro issues in public relations, again, social change, change in the nature of work, power, algorithms, privacy control and transparency issues, and then bias. Let's highlight a couple of examples from the report, ways this plays out every single day. One is facial recognition. I look at my phone and that's the passcode, right? Amazon, Facebook, Google, IBM, others, they enable someone like me to be identified from an image or, or video or just looking at my face. So they have the technology, they could sell that. Does that lead to bias coded into systems to amplify and exaggerate issues of race? Second example, uh, insurance companies with AI that makes rate-based decisions based on uh, postal codes or postcodes, zip codes. In other words, people who live in one neighborhood pay higher rates for the same insurance than people in another neighborhood. Okay, so the issue of facial recognition very much in the news at the moment. I think there are two ethical issues here, Doug. The first is as absolutely as you say about bias. And there's a huge confusion in some of this recognition software, which is deeply insulting and uh, deeply biased. And uh, we know, for example, that programmers of AI, only 11% of programmers and commissioners of AI are, are women. But if that wasn't as big a problem enough, we, we have huge issues around a surveillance society. You know, we some of these things are legitimate uses, facial recognition to prevent terrorism, um, our border forces use them, police forces use them, but these biases then come out about mm -hmm. the racial biases, uh, the gender biases come out. Right after we publish this report in the UK, Doug, you're going to talk about this example in a second here, but we were sort of blessed with this because what happens is a, a real live example in the UK of using artificial intelligence algorithms to assign grades to people in the post-COVID world. So I'll let you talk about that because I know you have a clip you'd like to play. Yeah, Jean, this, this came in light of COVID-19, right? Millions of students, yep. I, I mean, worldwide, um, but, but specifically in the UK, as you're talking about, couldn't take their final exams this past spring. So the regulator of qualifications, exams, and tests in England developed a grades standardization. It was actually an equation. Um, it was just algebra, uh, but everyone refers to it as an, as an algorithm. Schools were asked to make a fair judgment of the grade they believed a student would have achieved as well as rank the students within each grade. Now that's all part of a a normal process. Um, if it shocks you, that's a whole other podcast episode, I suppose, but that, that is, that's done worldwide by various education systems. But then in the UK, the schools themselves were ranked based on previous student performances in previous years. So the grades that other students got at the same schools was factored into your exam mark. They took all that and multiplied it by a factor of class size and that determined final grades. What could go wrong? Well, lots. It left Prime Minister Boris Johnson weighing in and blaming that mutant algorithm. It's right of the, out of the question. You couldn't sit your exams, which you yearned to do. And uh, I'm afraid that you're your grades were uh, almost derailed by a mutant algorithm. And I, I know how, how stressful that must have been uh, for, uh, for pupils up and down the country. 
and I'm very, very glad that it has finally been, uh, been sorted out. I mean, it's a classic example of, of trying to do good and, and, and having egg on your face because you didn't think through how this would play out. Yeah, the, the priority was to ensure that there wasn't something called grade inflation in the UK, so, um, so that the exam results weren't much better this year than they had been last year, because um, the argument is that teachers over predict grades. And so uh, the issue was, as far as government was concerned, we have to maintain the integrity of the exam system. So uh, algorithm, please don't inflate the grades. <laughs> the trouble is that there are people under that algorithm who were profoundly affected. And so some young people uh, in, in schools that had not performed particularly well in the past, they had their grades downgraded significantly. So it wasn't their performance, it was the school's performance that was judged. And in aggregation, all the schools together, of course, gave the, 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 uh, the, the results for the whole country and it was an, a desire to keep integrity on the results system as a whole, which meant that individuals were badly affected. Um, last question that I want to ask you both is, is about the direction of, of our, our profession. You can call it PR, communication strategy, whatever term you want to use. Uh, Basil Clark is considered the founder of the profession in Britain with the establishment of editorial services in 1924. Austrian-American Edward Bernays is often credited with being a pioneer for the role. And even he admitted that what we do for a living comes down to three things. Informing, persuading, and integrating people with people. And yet increasingly in this industry, we are talking about ethics. Simple question, are we becoming the ethics police? I think there's something that I'd like to add to that definition of Bernays coin because he wasn't thinking about it probably in those days, but you must work in a context of working in the public interest. If you do that, then yes, we are the ethics conscious of an organization because if you have that as your prime directive, your North Star, working in the, in the public interest to begin with, then you're not siding with your client all the time to the detriment of society or of others. So if you think of that mindset, are we the ethics police? Maybe not, but we are part of bringing to the fore the sort of ethical mindset we need to have for organizations to maintain their trust, their reputation, their they're licensed to operate. And so if we're not the police, we're certainly part of the organizational conscious about ethics. Public relations professionals have long wanted a place at the top table on boards. Um, it, it's been my privilege to serve on some boards and my job on the board was governance. That's the chief responsibility of anybody on a board. And really governance is about the long-term sustainability of the organization for it it to be constantly supported by those people who can make decisions about whether or not it continues. And there's been some work done in America by a company that puts valuations on, on organizations. It's an, a company called Ocean Tomo, and they've done some work on uh, the market value of the top 500 companies in the world, according to Standard & Poor. And what they've observed over time is, uh, listen to these figures. In 1975, the tangible assets of a company were worth 83%. So tangible assets, crudely put, are those things you can kick. It's buildings, it's money, it's equipment, it's vehicles, those sorts of things. Intangible assets were worth 17%, that's all. 2015, fast forward. Intangible asset value now is 84%. The things you can kick are worth 16%. So there's been a complete reversal. So what are intangible assets, you ask me? Well, their reputation, brand, relationships, all those things that are in our territory and the things that we would claim to have some expertise and authority over. And so as organizations are increasingly driven by AI and they become platform businesses and decision-making becomes absolutely 
driven by data, et cetera, et cetera, somebody has to take on that governance role, looking after those intangible assets that are so valuable to organizations. And you know what, folks? That's our territory. So understanding society, trends, attitudes, social connection, yep, that's us, folks. So we've often claimed the ethical guardian role. I'll tell you something, it's never been worth more. And therein lies the gold. Um, thank you both uh, so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. It was a pleasure, Doug. Thank you, Doug. If you'd like to send a message to my guests, you can do that. Jean Valin can be reached at jvalinpr. It's J-V-A-L-I-N-P-R at gmail.com. And Anne Gregory can be reached at a.gregory at h-u-d dot a-c dot u-k. Again, we've provided a link to download the AI in PR Ethics Guide in the show notes to this podcast. It is not a report to be read. It's a report to be used. If you liked what you heard today, we're hoping you choose to subscribe to Stories and Strategies and receive updated episodes automatically. We're also hoping that you choose to follow and rate this podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever directory you're listening on. It helps with the algorithm. And would you do us a favor, recommend this podcast to one friend. And if you have an idea for an episode or you just want to tell us something, send us a note at info at jgrcommunications.com. Thanks for listening.